There's an African proverb that says, until the lion tells his own story, then the tale will continue to glorify the hunter. Three years ago, my wife and I drove across the United States and we did this film called Independent America to document what we thought was this growing insurgency against corporate chains and the sort of rise of local consciousness. We were going to come to New Orleans. We didn't have time and we were exhausted. Six weeks later, Katrina hit. It was to my everlasting regret that we never came here. New Orleans is a very unique city. You know, we have great architecture and you know, we were sitting on this precarious position on the Mississippi River, surrounded by water on all sides. Geographically speaking, it's, it's, it's unique, but I think it's just the fact that these, all these cultures came and truly uh, melded together to create this one common culture. Even as Katrina was happening, uh, somebody who's in this film was emailing me saying, you know, I went to law school at Tulane. This town is your classic independent America city. So at some point while I was in law school, I got pretty sick and I, and I, I didn't go to class for a week or a little more. And they noticed it was breaking my pattern when school wasn't actually out. And next thing I know, the delivery guy from this store shows up in my house with some basic groceries and a big old muffaletta sandwich, which is a beautiful New Orleans Italian sandwich. Um, just in case, in case something was wrong. It's such a transparent thing here that these little businesses, you know, this is one household that was represented by this business, plus their delivery guy who was there all the time. So that's two households that earn their living out of this one little building. And it wasn't just, you know, stringing together part-time job kind of income, that, you know, from several jobs. This was a solid way to make a living and to be a part of the community. And yeah, so I think I was, I started becoming aware of it here, that it really does matter. It's sad that I can just take a, a drive two or three hours north of here and one city looks the same as the next city and it's hard to distinguish which town you're in. I always say that you're blindfolded, you're taken to New Orleans, you open a menu and you know where you are. And that can't be said anywhere else in the country. My father had been struck by a drunk driver and paralyzed for life. During that time, all the kids sort of divided things up and my specialty became breakfast and so, I started cooking breakfast for the family about nine. The dinner table was uh, everything in our house, and so that's where all the family business took place, meals every night, big meals, great meals. And I think my love for food and people really came from that. Once you understand this culture here, it's hard to leave it. There's such a strange love-hate that people have coming back and they're so sick of the rebuilding process and it's so much easier, cheaper to tear down and build something new that is not as enduring. There was open disdain for everything about the city of New Orleans. It was taken for granted that everything about the old New Orleans should be erased and replaced with something shiny and new. The blue on the sea, loose and complete under sky, so smoky blue-green. I can't foresee a Dixie dead shake, so we dance the sidewalk clean. My memory is muddy, what's this river that I'm near? New Orleans is sinking, man, and I don't want to swim. Kinds of issues that we faced overnight, every region has faced or will face, and how they reclaim their power in that city region will depend on how well they can hold. They know what's valuable to them. And the best thing about New Orleans is, Every single person here 
made a decision to come back. This area here used to be a very prominent strip mall. We had a Chase Bank, which has since closed, since Katrina. This area over here was a Rite Aid, and we also had a PJ's Coffee House. It helped support the life in this community. It was a very self-sustained community. So PJ's was a chain? Yes. Rite Aid was a chain? Yeah. PJ's was a franchise. And How does that make you feel that they didn't come back? <laughs> it's kind of upsetting, because I would come to this PJ's, have coffee, maybe sit down and do a little reading or studying back when I was in college. It just seems like life here isn't, it's like it's been given up on by state government, large retail chains. What's going to bring life back to your community? I think the community members are going to have to get involved. We're looking out at Gentilly, which is a real kind of bedrock kind of community. It was working class and lower middle class, middle class, um, post-World War II, but it is struggling. I mean, as you look out, there's uh, still trailers. There are very few of these houses, lots of trailers down there. Very few of these houses are occupied, gutted, some, some that have been completely just sort of left. You cannot shop in Gentilly. You can't buy an entire outfit from shoes to hat to coat to, you just can't do it in Gentilly. I mean, we get dollar stores. You, if, you, if you can find it at a dollar store, you can get it, but if you can't find it, and I love the dollar store, don't get me wrong, I really do, but if you can't get it at a dollar store, you won't get it in Gentilly, and we have universities here, but for some reason there's a disconnect in terms of what we get and what we deserve. People need to start getting organized and raising hell about it and making it a, a political embarrassment that the city can be considering giving away a couple of million bucks to a major corporation like Home Depot when there are such basic needs that are not being met. What is, a, what is your kind of like top priority? If you had to pick one store to open here at Mr. Joe's site first, what would be it? First thing he mentioned is a grocery store. Her first priority is a gas station, then a bank, then a coffee shop. Some fun stuff might be an upscale shop for stationery or gift shop and maybe an ice cream shop. Yeah. Well, we had a beautiful dress shop here before. Yeah. Yes, we did. <laughs> we had a beautiful yeah. dress shop we here did. before. Uh, credit union or bank, post office, shoe store, appliance store, grocery store, cell phone store, clinic, yeah. doctor, urgent care, a drugstore, a pharmacy, a craft shop. It's, it's just perception that we're not mm -hmm. back. There you go. Right. We're just not screaming loud and blue. Right. We're back. Right. We're back. Right. Right. Like she said, we're not making enough we're noise not, that we're not right. screaming right. enough that we're, we're back. back. Yeah. Back. What, popula I mean, what percentage of the population are you right now compared to pre Katrina? About 50. This house is occupied, that one, that one, this one, and every house past that is not. And every, so if you do the math, it's about 50% of the houses on this one little block. If nothing comes back or it comes back in a way that's not befitting of a person's lifestyle, they're not going to come back. We haven't even reached our pre-Katrina levels, right? We're still at least 100 to 150,000 people away from pre-Katrina levels. There's still a lot of people who haven't come home, and, and we, we still need a lot of help in order to make sure that we get them home. You say, neighbor, please come home, because we got the loans and things that, like that for them, and if they don't want to come home, put a for sale sign up. The parts of the city that flooded were the parts of the city that developers and the government built and told us were safe, put us in there, and then said, well, why are you there? New Orleanians knew what was high ground. They kind of got, they figured it out. They stayed in high ground until the 20th century, until the government came in and started telling them it was safe to live in lower-lying areas and said, the levees will protect you. <laughs> They'll protect you. Never again will New Orleanians believe anything without investigating it first. I think that in the age of disaster capitalism, rubble is the terra nullius, the open land. I was there 10 days after the, the levees broke. But you know, in the first week, we were hearing from top developers in New Orleans um, saying, you know, this city won't be rebuilt the way it was before. Um, and, uh, and, and it's a clean sheet. This, this phrase kept coming up again and again, clean sheet, as if this hor horrible disaster had created just this um, 
so, so, sort of a canvas on which corporate America could draw its most beautiful picture that could be Disneyland. It could be yeah, sort of X-rated Disneyland is what people were saying. That would be the future of New Orleans. What was it like here during the floods? How bad was it up out here? Oh, it was bad, yeah. We came back probably a year later, and it was still bad. And everything you see is new here, you know, the landscaping, the sheetrock, you name it. Where did it you go really during the floods? Jackson, Jackson, Mississippi. So how high was the water? Uh, well, however high that is, that's the water. My what is that? That's six, so it's like six feet. I've never actually measured it, actually. Six feet, well, six and a half, six feet, six inches. The hardest hit was my business. I had a backup system, but it wasn't very good, and it didn't bear any fear. And I cried so many days over that because it was it was everything. Well, I have all these little portable drives. I'm not feeling with this stuff. I'm gonna take the CPU on the ground there, and if I have to leave one of my children, the CPU is going in my car. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Like, I went to Atlanta to visit my sister. And I'm like, good Lord, she can just turn on her driveway and make another turn, and bam, all the retail and everything else, post office, it disappears. And, you know, for us, that's not, that's not a reality for us. You know, like I'm about to go on vacation. When I come back, you get in a funk when you come back. Because when you come back, you, you're going to see all this with fresh eyes because you haven't seen it in a week. When I drive around day in, day out, it doesn't really bother me because I see it. You get, you get immune to it. You know, you kind of seems normal. But then when you go away. Nobody has come back. As far as food goes on this side of the canal, then we're it. We're like a heartbeat for this area. And in a sense where people that are living in FEMA trailers or men that are working that don't have wives and you know, they're women home, then they need somewhere to eat and they need some good food. I've had this restaurant since 1991. And it closed for a while. And just before the storm, I was opening up September the 1st, 05. It fixed it up and everything, bought all the new equipment. And the week before I was opening up, not a week, a couple of days before I was opening up, the storm came along and destroyed everything. So we lived in Atlanta for nine months, and I decided to come back home. They're not coming back. Popeye's not coming back. Kentucky's not coming back and Walgreens right across the street from, the, from those two buildings, they are not coming back. They have sold their building to a charity organization. That's going Well, I guess they don't feel it's profitable enough for them to come back. Uh, you know, it's, uh, less than 50% of the people are back down here now, so I guess it's not profitable enough for them to come back. And, well, I live here. So that's the difference. I got everything that I need. I just need some customers, <laughs> that's all. You know, we see here how much quicker the local businesses are to come back, how reluctant any of the absentee-owned businesses are to reinvest in the community until it's back up on its feet and profitable. So it certainly, I think, is an instructive lesson to communities about becoming overly dependent on chains or other absentee-owned businesses and the importance for their long-term economic prosperity to have a very strong base of locally rooted businesses that are, are living in the community and therefore are not going to pack up their bags when things go a little bit sour. I see incredible determination among people who are figuring out ways to make it work in a portion of town where maybe five to ten percent of the population is back and yet you see new businesses coming in, you see businesses re-establishing themselves, you see businesses that never went out really except for the period of the storm that, that have confidence in their ability to be successful in this particular geographic point, as blighted and as vacant as it, as it looks. Because if I own a small business and God comes and knocks it down, the one thing I know to do and the one thing I can do to get my life back is to reopen my business. And so if I'm locally based, I can't just decamp to Atlanta and try selling po' boys over there, right? 
when I need to reopen and give it a shot. And, and around this town and, and, and certainly in other neighborhoods where there was a lot more damage, you'll see that the local businesses came back and they were really flagships in their neighborhood that sort of welcomed people back. And they adapted the stock that they sell very, very quickly. We were back just a couple of days after the storm. We left for, I guess, a day and a half to get some supplies and we came back. And I, I in a previous life, had been in the Marine Corps. And so some of my Marine Corps friends all got together and started sending me uh, generators and diesel fuel and gas and propane burners, what we would call uh, crawfish pots down here. And so we started making red beans and rice and just feeding whoever wanted food. And you know, it's one of those cases that you know you're from New Orleans when you're feeding people that are hungry, that complain that their mother's red beans are better than yours. <laughs> Woo. When it comes to things like red beans and rice and gumbo, everybody's grandmother makes it better. There were hundreds of boats being brought in from all over uh, South Louisiana, people launching their boats down here just right off the interstate to rescue folks. And it hit me that we've got this restaurant full of food. We've got uh, coolers and we've got dry storage and we have rice and we can marshal enough rice and beans and we can at least give people some sort of sustenance and as a cook, that's what I'm really called to do. We're not firefighters, we're not police officers, we're chefs, and we just did what we knew to, what to do, and that was feed people. You couldn't really get a lot of the big food purveyors to deliver. You had to make contacts with all your farmers and say, hey, how are you, how's everything going? What do you have? You have eggs? Cool, I want some, I need some eggs. You know, what are you growing? Peppers? Great, I want some peppers, you know? I mean, it was just, you kind of scrimping and scrimping from wherever you can find. You start making contact with, with not big seafood companies, but fishermen, you know, people who are actually out there selling shrimp. We relied on these people before the storm and we relied on them even more after the storm. Two, one. This is where the community gets built. So that's why bringing the market back the Tuesday before Thanksgiving in 2005 was one of the most vital and important things. Were you here? Oh, it was the most incredible day because we still didn't know really who was around and who wasn't. Um, and the, the community came back together. It was a little market, but it was a happy market. And everybody, although there were tears, there was incredible happiness, everybody seeing each other again. We had this little joke about this was the place where the New Orleans Uptown matron could go and look around and say, now this would be the Garden District girl who's, you know, maybe she had a little roof damage. But here at the market she could say, you see, nothing bad really happened. <laughs> and it's true. This, that became our motto for 2007. Where's the happiest place in New Orleans? The Crescent City Farmer's Market. We had a lot of customers who came in that were living elsewhere. And they said, well, Brookhouse is open and it gives us the courage to... Uh, to come back. It feels like, feels like home's coming back. The day we opened, we had people around the block waiting to get in. What were you hearing from them? What were they saying about it? Uh, thank you, thank you for reopening. We're glad y'all reopened. Uh, thank you for coming. A lot of thank yous. Like, if, you know, we, we were doing them a favor <laughs> by reopening. And I think it was an emotional event because my family's been in business in New Orleans for 103 years. And we celebrated the 100th anniversary just a month prior to Katrina. So it meant something that they weren't losing. It was a, a place that they could come to and feel some type of stability, uh, some type of connection with the past. <laughs> I, I myself was going stir crazy. I, I just wanted some something that used to be. And people would come in and just say, you know, it's chaos out there. But when we step foot in here, we get coffee, we get pastries, we sit down, we read the paper, we read a book. It's just calm and peaceful. And, you know, that really made us feel like we were doing, you know, something more for the community than for anything. And, and we were open seven days a week and I stayed open as long as I could. And I think we worked straight every single day, I think for at least a month and a half. It was really the only thing 
that people had to cling to, you know, just just to come and have a cup of coffee. It seems so simple until you don't have it. It's really hard to even describe. The first business is back. Um, we, we were so grateful to them. Uh, it was just like, oh, they're back. Someone's open. And I think a lot of businesses uh, really grew at that time. The, the ones that were able to open up really yeah. quickly um, grew. People because we didn't know. I remember coming here in the 1st of October, I believe, because that's when I came back. I was standing getting coffee, and a perfectly strange woman was standing next to me, and I was like overwhelmed with emotion, and I reached over and I hugged her, and I said, aren't we lucky that we're here? And she said, yes, and the question always is, and how did you make out? That was the question everyone asked for two years. But you made friends with everyone, because we were so happy. We were like a little island, you know, the, the half a dozen little stores that opened. And what else were you going to do? We had no homes. We were here having coffee. <laughs> it's much more hopeful in terms of the recovery than when a Starbucks opens or a Home Depot. You don't have this sense of, oh, the community is coming back and people whose lives are here are able to return to this world. How can the Cafe freaking Luna. Starbucks be so horrible about this? I, I'm mystified by these people. Uh, I mean, I you know, I, I'm not upset about it, on the other hand. No, I mean, absolutely I, not. I mean, it's just so weird. So what do we got here, Dan? We have a dead Starbucks. Yeah. Right smack dab in really the busiest, coolest commercial thoroughfare in the South. And, and I don't know why Starbucks didn't want to come back. I, I, it's too bad that the, the boards have been removed and the glass replaced, because at one point, when these were boarded up, there was fabulous graffiti about how crappy Starbucks is for not coming back and for not even trying. There's great local roast coffee across the street. They came back within weeks of the store. At Starbucks. Starbucks, what are we going on, three years? Starbucks is not my favorite, so it makes me kind of happy. It's kind of like, you know, I can do it, but you can't, you know? Or I want to do it, but, but you don't. It just tells a lot about what, what those bigger companies are really about and what the small local mom and pop companies are really about. And I hope that people see that. And I'm not the only one out there doing it. There were lots of places that opened. There were places uh, that stayed open through the storm, even though they, they were fined from the health inspectors for, for cooking and serving food. And they just said, we're not going to close. These people, you know, these people can't get food anywhere. And they're tired of eating peanut butter and crackers. And we're just, this is New Orleans, and we're going to do it the way we want. And so I'm not the only one out there, but all of them that stayed open and and did that kind of service are the small, individually owned or two people owned places, and that's what they do. They're not worried about their stocks. They're not worried about you know th their exact profit margins. They're worrying about doing their job, and their job is feeding people. I stayed here, uh, you know, at Katrina, like 12 days until the water went down. Then I went up to Ohio a little bit because the city had shut down, you know, so there was nothing happening. You know, so. And then uh, Hank called me from the Maple Leaf and uh, told me, said, well, look, Walter, man, look, I got, he stayed through the whole thing, you know. He said, look, I'm finna open up the club, you know. I got uh, some generators. If you could come down, you know, I'm gonna call a couple of cats and see can they come, you know, so, so. Like, so I came on down. Well, I love New Orleans, man. I, I missed it. You know, we, we live here in the community. We thought that bookstores are a place that are essential to a healthy community, and we just wanted to get open as fast as possible, and why wait for somebody else to take the leadership when you can make a difference? What was the reaction when you opened up? I know people... Oh, the reaction was just overwhelmingly supportive. I mean, I, I sent out an email I think the night after we opened, and uh, I have never gotten such response. Because a bookstore is a special community place, and it's and and the idea that that you could lose that 
the people didn't know whether they had lost their homes yet. Some people did lose their homes. They lost so much. And the, the, the signal that a bookstore, which is at the heart of, of a community, is going to be reopened is a signal that you can come back, that there's something to build on. As in our name, we are a community. We specialize in books, but we're a center. We're more than a store. We are a meeting place for many uh, organizations and groups, and we're just a place for people to come by and hang out and have a very lively discussions about current events, politics, whatever have you. And particularly post-Katrina, people needed a place where they could just take a break from what was happening in their own personal lives. Even though people would come in at that point and say, gosh, it's so great to have a business here. It's so great to see things coming back. Obviously, it's not a typical situation because people would come in and we had all our storm books right here on this front table. And you know, they would, they would come over and they'd take a look and you'd, I would look from my desk over there and they'd just be standing here just weeping. And it was the, the photographs of what was here before. So I guess it's kind of an odd thing to have merchandise that makes people weep, but um, because of what they've lost. I am the only educational supply store in the city of New Orleans. We had four feet of incoming water and I had a natural skylight. What happened was the roof peeled back like a sardine can. People don't come and loot educational stores. It's books, you know how they tell you, you can hide things in a book, people won't steal educational things. So my business wasn't looted, thank God for that. I guess they would just take a book and learn. So, so when you said you were doing business, though, that means you were doing business with evacuees up in Dallas, though. In Dallas so and were, Texas, the they were. The mobile teacher stop was up in Dallas. It actually started, yeah, like right then. Uh, that's interesting. Just people would call and say, okay, my child has a project, and Christy, we need some help. What can we do? Because they were in a new city and places. They didn't know where to go, what to buy. They were just familiar with New Orleans. tell businesses come back. They want to help the businesses come back. They want people to come back. With all the school thing, everyone would, would have thought that, oh, schools are, are starting over, so they're going to have to buy new supplies and they're going to come to you. But what had happened, government gave them so many supplies. And when government gave them supplies, it was through government bids. With them doing it that way, it kind of knocked out the smaller stores. There was very little public discussion about that borders. They've left the facades of that building and they're inserting a suburban model border store in between those walls that will be sort of bolted to the wall. We're going to do an excellent job at what we do and, and provide the best service we can and, and show people what the difference is between what we do and what they do. They were open up until the storm. In, oh, fact, in fact, there were bodies in there that got um, left oh. for... Um, you know, like a long time. This was another one of those, surprise, you're getting a chain bookstore in your neighborhood. This is a real key intersection here. And yet, what do we have? We have a, a closed up gas station. We have a Rite Aid. We have an empty lot where a cafe restaurant once stood. And adjacent to that is one of the few McDonald's in, you know, cl close proximity. As people are looking at it, they, they, the, the preservation of this footprint was extremely important. And so by making that concession, then they were able to, to push this through with very little resistance. They have an investment here, which they may be able to sever, and or they may simply be happy with collecting their uh, insurance while they wait and see what happens. And meanwhile, we're out in the trenches doing what needs to be done to jumpstart the economy and to bring the place back. We were lucky and very unlucky. Um, out here in Metairie, we took on a little water, but not much at all. We were the first supermarket that opened up on Veterans Highway uh, after the storm. We opened September 19th, which was only 20 days after the storm hit. 
Uh, we had a lot of cleanup to do. We text the councilman and said, hey, we've got milk, we've got water, we've got bread, we've got food. If you can get us back into the city, we can open up the store and y'all can have it. And essentially, they did do that. We acted as the supply center for the whole Jefferson Parish in the beginning. It was a week before the Fed sent down a bottle of water to Jefferson Parish. So they were relying on us in the very beginning to serve the community. The original store in New Orleans, there was a different story. Now, you know, for the first time in the 75 or 80 years we had been at that location, uh, there was flooding there. And the merchandise was ruined, and it sat for two and a half weeks in water that was approximately 18 to 24 inches high. We applied to the city for permits to rebuild, tear down and rebuild, and we had to get approval, and that approval took about nine months. Had we been able to do what we wanted to do when we wanted to do it, undoubtedly we'd have a new building there now. How does that make you feel? Because that, that, that location is so historic to your family. The area that we serve, the uh, Gentilly and Elysian Fields, and everything east of that location, there is only two or three supermarkets that are open to service that whole area. So that area is terribly underserved. The garden has had its ups and downs, not just post Katrina, but post George Bush. People are really aware that like groceries are getting really expensive and, and, and hard to find in New Orleans now. There's a grocery down Carrollton Avenue here, but there used to be a, a, three groceries within a mile and a half radius. You should shop and buy your food closer to your home. Sure. And Let's we face it, should. we don't. We go far away to get. So that's why he's saying it's a food desert because it's barren. We don't really have grocery store options mm -hmm. close to our home. I'm, so. I'm tired of my ice cream melting by the There you go. Yeah. Don't make a stop. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> You're in trouble. Stop for gas after. You're in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> Even grassroots organizations, neighborhood associations, neighborhood level organizations who assemble all the resources they need, say, to bring a grocery store in their community, they can submit a proposal and receive funding from. Help notice me, Dana. Of, notice it's, of funding availability, it comes through federal. Through the Office of Recovery, right. Blakely's office. This has been such a low tax environment uh, that it's been very difficult. Well, somebody's coming in there. It's been very difficult to have a tax base that would support doing a lot of this. About 80% of our taxes go to police and fire. So that doesn't leave you a lot to do streets and things like that. You see things and, you know, if, you, if you, there's no straight line to recovery. You know, I wish there were, but there isn't a straight line. We're gonna have to do something about this street. There's no straight line to that because the developer is supposed to be responsible for the streets. We're going right. So what's the purpose of this bike ride, Dr. Blake? Uh, well, this is about my, oh, 12th, 14th bike ride. And the purpose of all these bike rides is, uh, well, two reasons. One, you, you really can't see a city or understand a city uh, in an automobile or fast moving. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on here. Illegal dumping. I wanna, I wanna call, get that called in. Okay, here's the city at work putting this street in. People say we don't do anything. There's some of our work right there. Okay. What would help you the most right now to get, to get the job done? What would help me the most? A little less criticism, a little more work. Oak Street Hardware has been on Oak Street since 1929. My dad bought it from the original owner in 1964. We've been here through freezes where everyone's pipes have busted, through hurricanes, through tornadoes, through floods, through looting. I showed up every morning to repair the doors and the glass. Every morning they, they broke in. We kind of patrolled Oak Street. Unfortunately, we had to arm ourselves. We started haphazard selling out of the store. You know, it was kind of a meeting place too for people. Lowe's opened, I think, May 2007. 
business has been dropping ever, ever since. It wasn't so bad in the beginning, but um, it's, it's gotten worse. I mean, I would like to think that we, we, we provide a nice tax base for the city of New Orleans between property taxes and sales taxes. We're rebuilding a city. A lot of plywood and sheetrock and tons of nails and paint. I shop at Clement Hardware on Magazine Street. However, I need four nails, I need picture hooks, I need a hammer. I wouldn't drive to Lowe's or Home Depot for that. But in rebuilding a house, yes, I would go to Lowe's and Home Depot. I think, every, I think there's room for everything. So the pressure from the ordinary citizens to bring more Walmarts, bring more Lowe's, bring more Home Depots, uh, and you say, well, that's gonna put these you know, little guys out of business. And they say, well, right now, I gotta think about building my house. I can't think about that guy's business. At least a few times a day, you'll get people come in and say, oh, I couldn't find it at Lowe's, and I've, I've searched all over town, and they only live a few blocks away, and it kind of hurts your feelings, you know, after, after serving them, helping them through all kinds of problems. You know, and then they'll, they'll, they'll start a project, go buy everything from, from them, and then come to you for the final thing that they can't quite get, or they just one little piece short, and, you know, it just kind of grates on you, honestly. You know, and after it happens quite a few times, you know, they, they make the statement, eh, don't take it personal. Well, you know, when you, when, when you have to drop your health insurance and you can't order quite as much inventory as you want and you have to watch what you're doing, like, like most business people, you know, it, you do take it personal. Aren't those little guys are the ones who were around when, after Katrina who opened their building businesses when nobody else was around to help? Well, they, and they've been around for, for decades. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but when you're going in the store, you don't say who was around. You say, what's this going to... You know, your pocketbook doesn't recognize uh, uh, the attributes of, of uh, stability and longevity. Your pocketbook doesn't stretch that far. You, you're not getting an extra dollar every week for that recognition. And you've got a family to feed and the price of that's gone up. Utilities bills here are through the roof. There's only a certain amount of dollars to go around, and you, you know they, they take a, a lion's share of it, it seems like. I understand competition, and I understand that's, you know, that's just the way business is. The local government seems to cater to them, and they've forgotten about us. Because after the storm, all the chain stores, of course, went to the city government and started saying, what do you, what do you got for me? We have gotten no help from from, from the government, certainly none from the city government, except raising our property taxes, $4,000. A Walmart corporation has received well over a billion dollars in public subsidies, uh, just those that were able to be quantified and measured, and many folks are estimating that's probably less than 10% of the actual total. And even if your community isn't offering those subsidies, it's a single bank account for these companies. So any subsidy anywhere in the country or in the world is creating a distinctly uneven playing field. It's our tax dollars that are going to fund the construction of our competitors. That's amazing. What's your recourse? Nothing. Just fight hard. So they come in, they pay no rent, and, and from what I understand, they pay their employees terrible. So they come in and give very low prices, um, which we have to then try to compete against. It's, it's almost like being in business against your hometown government. You have corporations like Cabela's and Bass that are getting multi-million dollar subsidies across the country. And community after community, they're able to sell this as, hey, this is going to be a big tourist attraction, and if you don't give us money, we're going to open up in the town next to you and suck the life out of the sporting goods stores in your community basically a you know, legalized extortion, but it's succeeding on a grand scale. What absolutely scares me and, 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 and freaks me out the most is the cities that are getting in business with these big stores like Cabela's and Bass Pro Shop to not just entice them to come into town, but are giving them the buildings free, you know, to come compete with their local merchants. You know, don't put a thumb on a scale at the very least. Small businesses, I mean, these people are not socialists. They don't want the government to futz with them at all. I mean, they, they want the government to leave them alone and give them a permit, but they definitely don't approve of the government then getting into the market and playing favorites with non-locals. So, you know, really, all local businesses ask is that 
keep a level playing field and let them compete fairly. If you talk to my father, who's president of the company, he's burned and chapped and just, you know, it's, it's you know, the why not invest in the city. It has been such a slow, hard slog for this part of town that I'm excited when anybody opens doors and creates commerce and jobs. That we would invest in our own, I would I'd far prefer that. But at the same time, you know, for the first year that we were out here, I think grocery shopping was um, hitting the, the mini mart at a gas station, and there was one in the area. You know, so when a Winn Dixie opened, which is not locally owned and it is a chain, it was still such a gift. But the tax incentive is a little bit infuriating. If you um, put other businesses out of business, at the same time you're adding um, low-paying jobs that perhaps don't have good benefits or other kinds of things that we would hope to have in our community, we really haven't done anything positive to increase the quality of life for the whole community. And I, I think those are the kinds of things that we ought to ask really hard questions about before we say, oh yeah, come in and we'll give you everything. If it keeps going the way it's going, either we'll have to do some dr drastic changes, you know, I could foresee giving it up. I mean, I can, I could probably make more money renting my building than I'm, than I'm taking out now. In the post-storm uh, scenario, it's, it's interesting because small businesses have really been here and they came back right after the storm, citizens who knew how the city worked and, and knew how to get things going. They, they got us up and got us operating. Uh, but the city is really coming in and subsidizing these big re retailers, right? And the big retailers are coming in and essentially they're going to kill these small retailers. And so if, if the city subsidizes a Walmart or subsidizes a, a, a Home Depot, they're really subsidizing the process of killing all the small businesses that have really helped to prop the city up and sustain it this far through the recovery. When we developed the uh, revitalization of St. Thomas, the city had promised to put $20 million of infrastructure into the development, and the mayor told me they just didn't have the money. So I had to find another way to bring the $20 million to do the infrastructure of the project. And we had a vacant industrial corridor adjacent to the area that we were going to develop. And I told the mayor that if I can bring a retailer to town, one of these major big boxes, they pay lots of sales tax. If we could take that sales tax and use it as a revenue stream to create the $20 million, would you do that? He said, absolutely, if you can pull that off. And so we scoured the market. This was before Katrina. And only Walmart was interested in op opening an urban store in the city of New Orleans. They came in and actually paid all of their taxes and put the first large big box. That made a lot of sense because all of the people in Orleans Parish were driving to the suburbs to do their big box shopping taking their tax dollars out of the cities. The amount of federal subsidy um, that's available for public housing and for, for, for housing across America uh, has declined. And so developers have had to look for other ways and housing authorities have had to look for other ways in order to, um, to finance their projects. And what's striking about Walmart in New Orleans is that precisely this model of knocking down public housing and replacing it with so-called mixed-use housing, which has very few actual affordable housing units, um, at, with a Walmart as the centerpiece. Um, w there was a huge battle in New Orleans over this before the hurricane. They're a good corporate citizen, and the fact is, it isn't necessarily an either-or situation with the local businesses and the, and the chain retailers. The question is, how do we preserve, nurture, strengthen the businesses born and raised here who come back first when we need them? How do we ensure that those corporate citizens are good to us and, and don't capsize the local economy? Towns across America favor big box stores through economic development tools known as pilots and TIFs. These tools allow them to quickly approve new projects without appearing to raise taxes. In both cases, a town will issue bonds to finance construction of a new retail property. With payment in lieu of taxes, or pilot, the big box store transfers over title of their property in exchange for the public financing. 
because the town now has title to the land, the big box no longer has to pay property tax. Instead, the big box company usually agrees to pay a smaller percentage of what it would normally owe in property taxes. This often saves the company millions of dollars over several years. With tax increment financing, or TIF, the town pays off those bonds by redirecting the revenues from a big box's property taxes or sales tax. Both pilots and TIFs usually benefit the larger size big boxes to the detriment of independent local businesses. Big box taxes are either reduced or they're diverted into specific projects. Either way, the town's general treasury gets less money. This usually means that mom and pop now have to shoulder a larger tax burden, even as they face increased competition and usually reduce sales from the presence of these out-of-town giants. The problem is that, that these, these, these tax breaks are usually in the form of debt, and small businesses can't handle any more debt. Uh, so, it, you know, in appearance it looks like a tax break, but in fact it's a debt instrument. You know, a go zone bond, something, you've got to pay it back, and small businesses can't handle that. Um, occasionally, there's something that's done for a big business like street closures and that sort of thing. See, now we can't do anything about that situation there because it's right on the private property. So those people are within the legal limit, but this one here looks like a takedown. No, it's got it. Well, no, there's fire damage. Barry! Where's Barry? Barry, it's fire damage. 1515. We try to create diverse, vibrant, and sustainable communities. And what we saw after Katrina was that there was going to be a great need for housing because people had been dislocated in the hundreds of thousands. And that the federal government would be supplying lots of dollars to help us rebuild. And so we tried to help the public agencies formulate policy that would develop mixed income housing. We were concerned that all the money would go into affordable housing and you'd end up creating concentratedly poor communities. The Housing Authority of New Orleans decided that they're going to demolish all the city's public housing and they don't provide an adequate plan that will allow citizens to um, to return or to find enough intermediate housing while they do so. And then what they also say is, well, we promise that we're going to give you um, more complexes like River Gardens, right? And remember, River Gardens doesn't adequately provide low-income housing. Only 7% of residents were uh, supposed to be low-income citizens. The ability to provide public housing in, ends up being tied to the success of, uh, of retailers. And so it, it, this is just a classic example of having these controversial policies already on the books, already lying around. But you have this problem. And what's the problem? Well, it's people you know, and their stubborn ways and the fact that they organize their communities and the fact that they have opinions about how their communities should run. Um, and that's extremely inconvenient to this, you know, to, to, to this vision. It's much more convenient to imagine a blank slate, a clean sheet where you can just build it. And what's so striking about the housing projects is that most of them sustained minimal flood damage. So the, the whole idea that they are being destroyed because of Katrina is a lie. They're being destroyed because Katrina created the excuse to destroy them. My girl, my girl, don't lie to me. Tell me where did you sleep last night? Come on, tell me, baby. In the pond, in the pond, by the sun. Don't ever shine. I will give you all night through. How do you feel about some of the issues that are sort of surrounding the, what people think is like the privatization of the public housing around here? Uh, that is national phenomena. And uh, wow, wow, what have we got going on here? What have we got going on here? Where's the Councilman, what do we got going on here? It looks like we took out a house. They demolished one house, and, and if you see the stick, they're going to put another house there. Okay. The other houses have not been done. Yeah, but see, we can't demolish this house. I assume it's occupied? No. It's unoccupied? So we can't touch it. 
we got to find out, you know, who the people are who live there, where they're going to come back or anything. We might be able to do something over there. But even that's not a bad structure. Funny we don't want to demolish it. Part of what, what we look at and, and question is how the, the large businesses don't just come in here and, and start up like, a, a, like Hillary has, for example, with her own capital and so forth, but with a lot of tax subsidies and, and so forth. And what it really boils down to is your tax dollars, my tax dollars, Hillary, as a small business owner's tax dollars, going to subsidize the, the large chain. And so what if that million dollars was divvied up among 10, 15, 20 small business hardware stores, how much could they expand their capacity to provide us what we need in the way of sheetrock nails, et cetera, et cetera? I think your, your theory is wonderful, uh, but frankly, I just think it's a pipe dream. Here's mo follow the money. If a big box is coming in here, somebody's got their hand out. And in this case, it was very beneficial to Nagan. I'm probably gonna be sued for this. <laughs> but yeah, um, come on. Clement Hardware is not gonna give Nagan's sons a contract to install uh, granite. Yeah, he's a businessman first, politician second, and and his his decision to to help his sons create this opportunity with this granite contracting um, deal with Home Depot demonstrates what his long term view is and his, his long range plans are and it's I think as a businessman that's where he intends to continue um, working and so you know it's probably a very pragmatic decision on his part and makes personal sense but as a mayor of a city struggling to recover it it's horrible. <laughs>
there's this realization that, oh my God, I can get the products and I can get it right here. It's, it's so good, it's cheap, and I didn't have to drive all the way to the grocery store. I didn't have to go and hit some farm stand out in the middle of nowhere to get these peaches. I, I can come right here and it's in my backyard. I mean, then that's the realization. I mean, it's always been here. It's just people are now starting to really utilize it and get involved and, and, and they want to be a part of it, you know? And that's, that's, that's the best thing. I mean, we're, you know, we're kind of going backwards in a way, but it's, it's a good way. I mean, it's, it's the way we need to be going. The more you become aware of your endangered food systems, the more valuable your local food connection becomes. So we are, in essence, lucky because we've been whacked so hard here that in some ways we're so far behind, we're actually getting ahead. So we've got green space that other urban areas don't have. Ours is all conveniently green. What to do with vacant land and helping people in their rebuilding process to utilize their yards as sources of uh, producing food, which is something that is, you know, akin to our history here. A lot of people are looking at it as a way of actually at least supplementing their diet. And uh, in my case, uh, I eat out of my garden every day. Every dinner, most of what you're gonna find on the table is gonna be from the garden here, or from the river, because I live on the river. Every house here belongs to a farmer. All the melons, herbs, eggplants, squash, peppers, and um, just one patch leads to the next. They go on and on and on. And it, it's amazing. It's amazing out here. With the adversity of the storm and um, everything that they've been up against, they've come back uh, with vigor and enthusiasm and you know, to talk about creating something land you know really i think this is this has never been done before not in new orleans having a uh, green community garden mm -hmm. i mean the, the 20 acres is basically uh, when when it is complete it's going to be the largest in the united states there's no urban problem that large because we're still within the city limit we basically 95 percent recover six months ago so right now we're we can, we can say that we are complete with our uh, recovery and we are moving on to development. To me it means a lot to support these communities. We have towns and villages all across South Louisiana dependent upon people like me buying shrimp from them. A lot of the French Quarter restaurants, they use pretty much domestic, but you know, your, your um, Red Lobsters and your Applebee's and your, you know, big chains, they all worry about the money, you know, they, they get strictly imports. You start thinking, well, what am I going to do if I don't do this business? Because I don't know anything else. It's what, you know, my dad does, his dad, me and my brother. That's all we know. Well, I mean, I'm getting like 85, 85, 90 cents a pound right now. By the time you finish and pay all your expense, that's all you're coming out, about $200. So how, how much on, longer do you can stay in business? Not much longer. Matter of fact, she might be on her last leg. No, I got the motorbikes off having trouble with it. Might not even make it out tonight. Well, good luck to you all. Hey, good luck to all of us. Nice to meet you. We're in this together, man. Yes, we are. To me, the great tragedy of what's happened in New Orleans is not that the city wasn't rebuilt exactly as it was. It's the democracy. It's that people were, who, who had lost so much, who had been utterly abandoned by all three levels of their government, left on their roofs and their attics, lost loved ones, treated with such inhumanity and such brutality were excluded from the only thing that really could have healed their community, which was to reimagine a better city. If people don't have fresh fruit or groceries nearby, let's start there. Then let's focus on providing basic clothing and hardware and the other pe things people need and make sure every part of the city has that within a reasonable walking distance. And if the economic development money is put in that direction to do those market studies, to provide the kind of consulting and support for local entrepreneurs, low interest loans. If you put a couple of million dollars into that kind of activity, it's gonna create so much more wealth for New Orleans. We have an opportunity post-Katrina to create 
all sorts of resources in our own neighborhoods from scratch so that we don't have to drive and mm -hmm. use gas. We can walk. Mm -hmm. We don't even have to use gas to leave our driveway. We can walk mm -hmm. to these businesses. I can walk. You can't say, let them come and then I'll build it. It's more the build it and they'll come. You gotta kind of balance that dynamic because you know, when uh, you look at like a mall or go out in suburbia, build a mall, up, then all of a sudden all the subdivisions pop up around that retail center. So it's kind of like, it's, a ca it's not necessarily, and I think we've been relying too much on the, if y'all come and show me you'll come, then I'll build it. Everything from schools to commercial facilities. And in my humble opinion, that's not the entire dynamic. The dynamic is you put something there I want and we'll start migrating to that area. There it is. It's Merlin's. Merlin's, that's right. But the, so the businesses like Merlin's and Sweet Savers, they're having to take this leap of faith and come back with the belief that if they come back, despite the fact that there are very few people living in the neighborhood, by coming back, the customers will still find them. So um, it's that they're trying to break that chicken and egg cycle, you know? They're, they're saying, okay, if build I build it, build it and they will yep, come. They're, they're still working on that. And it's, it's see, now Merlin's has just opened up in the last couple weeks or reopened, so. It looks pretty packed. It does. It's one of very few eateries in Gentilly. So what's so special about your restaurant? Why do people come from far and beyond to eat here? Because we're from here and we know what people like here and, and we're just, it's a New Orleans style type of cooking. My dad learned how to cook from his great grandmother. So he's been cooking for a very long time. He has old recipes which make our cooking here just a little bit different. I'm learning from my dad. I do, I do some of the cooking. I make the hot sausage every morning, the hamburger fresh. We didn't have a restaurant before the storm. Um, I'm, hopefully I'm starting something. I, I welcome other restaurants. I would like this area to be known again as a, a restaurant area, a food place. Do you think you act as a symbol for the rest of the neighborhood then, in terms of you're here, it's okay to come back? Sure, sure. The, uh, the, the juju bag opened up, uh, coffee shop, the cleaners is about to open, and the gas station has opened. I was the first to open, and these guys had followed right behind, so it's, it's, I think it's on a good roll. I think it's people like this that are making a difference in the community. And the fact is, it's people, it's not government, and it's not big business, but it's little business and it's uh, little people like us that are making a difference. And that will be the success of New Orleans. There's a handful of real cities in this country that have streets like this. And you know, for a second tier city in the Sun Belt, it's a little surprising to come and find such a great urban diversity uh, of businesses lined up in a really urban setting like this. I think what they need is leadership. They need to hear from the city leadership that local businesses matter, that what they're doing matters, that we want to talk to them and get their input into what it is that they need to stabilize, sustain, and grow, which is what they want to do. That's why they're here. Did it ever cross your mind not to reopen after Katrina? No. Why not? It wasn't an option. First of all, New Orleans is my home. And secondly, just the commitment we have to our friends and our family. It's just what we love to do, and it's necessary. So if not us, who? So back in New Orleans for the film premiere. We'll see how it goes. Uh, the possibility of another hurricane coming through here just around the time of the film. I think if there's either a mandatory or voluntary evacuation, then we'll, of course, um, have to postpone. A mandatory evacuation is likely tomorrow for Orleans Parish. Yes, it is, and when it's ordered by the mayor, they are to leave. This garage closes starting at noon, Saturday the 30th. That was the day we were supposed to have the premiere. So today is the third anniversary of Katrina. We got possibly Hurricane Gustav coming into town. So everybody's talking about evacuation right now. If we weren't here at all, the small businesses, the restaurants, the the coffee houses, the bookstores, the, um, the hardware stores, I mean, who, you know, we might not have a city at all right now. Fundamentally for me, my interest in doing this movie was not necessarily to make a, a, a film about New Orleans. It was to make a film about a community in distress and how it came back and how the rest of the country and maybe even the rest of the world can look to New Orleans as an example 
of when this happens to you, and it will in one way or the other, what are you going to do, and who's going to be there to help you? The lesson here is do it yourself. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps because you, you're the only one that's going to do it. We're waiting for Gustav. Category 3 predicted evacuation urged. This is the mother of all storms. This storm is so powerful and growing more powerful every day that I'm not sure we have seen anything like it. The National Weather Service is saying it's the worst possible storm that they can imagine. Okay, thanks. All right, bye-bye. What did you just do? Were you just calling for plywood? I'm not panicking. I am just trying to be prepared. You see this window right over here? We have a... This is our Katrina souvenir right here. That was all it did, but it's, it's kind of a big, a big window of vulnerability right there. So you just, who did you just call? Uh, Oak Street Ace, my neighborhood hardware store, for, they, for plywood. People are, people are coming in, you know, people are very aware of what's going on and they're pretty nervous, and which I can't blame them because uh, people in New Orleans have been through a lot. You want to go first? Yeah, sure, why not? The ones that are most invested here, the local businesses, are going to be the ones that come back because, I mean, for one thing, they don't have any other options. So th their, their instinct, as is ours as residents, is to get back to normalcy as quickly as possible, and that means, where they're concerned, they're going to open up their business as quickly as possible and start serving whoever is here. I am tired of evacuating for hurricanes. So until they find a solution to that, we'll have to keep doing it. So you are going to come back? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it won't take two years this time. I'll probably come back immediately, even if there is a huge disaster. I'm not sure what left there is to wipe out. I mean, as you can see, this house is still, still in shambles. Still. What is the latest, Steve? Right Same thing. How's your inventory now? Oh, we're, we're down. You know, we're, we're, we're almost out of, you know, D battery. We still got some flashlights left and some plastic for covering things. And How about plywood? Gone. That's gone. Uh, that was gone yesterday, but uh, you anybody, know we're still servicing people, so you know we'll we'll see. We'll anybody keep. say anything about Lowe's or Home Depot here? Well, I had a guy call me uh, about ten minutes ago. Uh, the guy at Lowe's sold him a generator, and he's angry. He was angry. He was kind of angry at me because the guy at Lowe's sold him a generator that's not hooking up to his 220 power. I was, I was like, I was like, I feel for you, buddy, but you need to call him. Just some little sticks in the yard, no big whoop. Plywood looks like it was beat up a little bit, not much. It's still really quiet here in the neighborhood. I hear there's a uh, power up on Oak Street, so maybe I can juice up my phone. I can do that with a car charger. Here's the culprit right here. This is why we don't have power in the next block over. Does. Like a tree coming back to life now. No leaves are growing. Oak Street is open. Ace. Maple Leaf never closed. Under a crescent city starlight. Sunshine of spring will bring birth bloom. And fruit, New Orleans will rise in your heart, you know it's true. And when you go to bed at night, it's gonna be alright. Another Crescent City starlight. Blues and fruit. New Orleans will rise 
confident in your heart to know it's true. And when you go to bed at night, it's gonna be all right under the Crescent City starlight. Back to life. New leaves are growing through the night. With spring comes the lesson of a new life under the crescent city starlight. Don't you know it's yeah, coming back? Don't you know it's coming back? 